This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your hosts, Radio Joe Hughes and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. This week is episode 605, and we welcome Dr. Jeff Siegel back. Looking forward to spend five years, hard to believe. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit on a researcher's perspective on COVID-19 risk mitigation, and we're also going to talk about some, some interesting research he's been doing over the years here on uh, filters in homes and tie that into the COVID thing, so it's going to be a great interview. Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They are the reason IAQ Radio continues to be on the air. Our newest sponsor is the Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification. Learn more at iicrc.org and the Healthy Buildings America 2021 in Honolulu, Hawaii, August 10 through 12. Learn more at hb2021-america.org. IAQ Radio Association sponsors are the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. Learn more at acgih.org the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Learn more at CIRIscience.org. The Indoor Air Quality Association. Learn more at IAQA.org. AIHA, healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And the Restoration Industry Association. Learn more at restorationindustry.org. IAQ Radio Industry Sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Learn more at AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man with this week's IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Hello, everyone. The IAQ Radio Trivia Question for today, Friday, November 6th. 2020 has been sponsored by IDEA is a solution chemistry company providing unique solutions to odor removal, surface cleaning, and decontamination problems. Congratulations go out to Doug Conan, Aerotech Environmental, Dayton, Ohio, who was first to correctly identify the albino squirrel as the legendary animal on the University of Texas campus that when seen on the way to take an exam improves your grade. Here's today's IQ radio trivia question. It's indicated that the spillover event introducing humans to SARS-CoV-2 is likely to have occurred in late 2019. When no members of the community are immune and no preventative measures taken, how many new infections do epidemiology studies estimate to occur with each infection? Back to you, Joe. Okay, joining us today is Dr. Jeff Siegel. He's a professor in the Department of Civil Engineering and the Dalai Lama School of Public Health at the University of Toronto. And, uh, you know, we've had Dr. Siegel on the show in the past and look forward to a great interview today. Hello, Dr. Siegel. We have you. Yep. How are you doing, hey. Joe? Great to see you. It's so good to have you back. Um, you know, we were chatting before the show and uh, I didn't even get to ask the, you know, the, the question that I wanted to start with here, which is how are things in, in Canada when it comes to COVID? Uh, you know, the coronavirus, the pandemic, um, you know, we, we get some reports here in the States that you're doing better than us, but I'm wondering how you feel. Yeah, you know, um, Canada is like the U.S. It's a lot of different places with different stories. Uh, but I would say that overall, we're doing better than the U.S. and we have relatively consistently. I would say we were doing quite well in general in the late summer especially. So uh, I'm in Ontario, which has a population of about 12 million. By the third or fourth week of August, we were down below 100 cases in the entire province. So those are pretty good numbers and pretty encouraging. Since then, we've been doing much less well. Still better than a lot of places, so I'm not going to complain. 
uh, but uh, things are definitely getting worse. Our kids are back in school, at least those who want to be uh, back in school. Uh, and I'm really worried about how that's going to go. Uh, and, you know, we've had some real tragedies. Uh, what's happening and happening and has happened in long term care homes uh, has just been horrible. And I really hope that there is a national reckoning about uh, what we're doing about indoor air quality in, in long term care homes. I think another story that um, I think Canada has not done well on is uh, farm workers, uh, seasonal farm workers. Uh, and I think that, you know, Canada, a lot of Canada is agricultural uh, based. And uh, I think we've done, again, a national tragedy, a horrible job uh, in that department. Um, mm. But, you know, at the same time, there's also been some successes. I think initially British Columbia on the West Coast did great. As I said, I think Ontario kind of maybe started out a little rough, but got things in a really good shape by the end of the summer. Um, Quebec has been persistent challenge, I would say. Uh, uh, and so, oh, and the, uh, the East Coast, the uh, Atlantic uh, Coast has been doing spectacularly almost throughout the whole, whole pandemic. So, you know, a lot of different stories, different places overall. Obviously, life is very different. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be in a, in a job where, um, you know, uh, uh, it hasn't had a big impact on my employment or anything like that. Um, but definitely we're in a whole different place and it's going to take us a while to get back, uh, you, even assuming we can get back at some point. How's the college? Are, are the, do you have in-class or in-person classes? Or is everything virtual? Is it a mix? Yeah, so uh, everything is virtual and it varies a little bit across the university, but at this point, essentially everything is virtual and that happened starting in about mid-March. Uh, and uh, so even the end of our winter semester, we call it. Uh, we're also all online, at least in the Faculty of Engineering, uh, in this coming winter semester. And I anticipate we'll also be all online in fall 2021. Um, so I'm anticipating the first time we'll come out of, uh, you know, a kind of a full online mode. I mean, there is scattered stuff here and there, so it's not really full online, but but essentially speaking, that we'll be out of this full online mode. The earliest is 2022. And as far you know, we were talking before the show, and and you mentioned that actually some of the class sizes had increased. I'd been seeing the opposite in some places. Um, can you tell listeners a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I think the big change I've noticed, and this is probably because I'm teaching a graduate course, is that my graduate course is bigger than it's ever been. Uh, and uh, it's on indoor air quality and a typical number is let's say 15 to 20 students. Uh, we started off the semester well over double that. We were, I was 40 something. It's dropped a little bit since then. Uh, uh, students are under a lot of stress now. And so I think you know a lot of students are dropping and so on. But basically what's happening is that, you know, the job market has got a lot of uncertainties in it, uh, as I'm sure everyone knows. And so a lot of students are saying, well, I might as well go back and get a master's degree um, to, you know, use this time productively. And so we have a big increase in uh, our master's of engineering, which is our kind of one year coursework based master's course. And the comment I would make about that is, you know, one hand is great, people getting education, but uh, I sure hope it's not a default. That is to say that, uh, uh, you know, uh, we should really be working very hard to kind of correct all the economic issues that have come out of this so that students have more options. On the undergraduate side, we've also actually seen, I mean, that's kind of more fixed, uh, but we definitely have seen very consistent, if not a little bit higher enrollment. There's maybe been a little bit of a shift, uh, you know, fewer international students, more domestic students, things like that, but actually not that big shifts at all in any direction. You mentioned um, your kids are back to school. Is that nationwide or all the, is that province by province or nationwide? It's pretty much province by province. You know, all education issues from everything from higher education on down is provincially done. So different provinces are doing it differently. Um, and, you know, in Ontario, uh, you know, kids are given a choice or parents are given a choice whether their kids do uh, online uh, uh, learning uh, or, or in class. 
um, my daughter's an only child. Uh, she was well sick of uh, uh, Lois and I, my wife and I, after this uh, summer. And so, uh, uh, so uh, yeah, it was a no-brainer to send her back to class from that perspective. Um, but, um, yeah, it, things have not been handled well in schools. Well, let's talk a little bit more about that. We want to we want to talk a little bit about masks and PPE and social distancing and, and get your perspective on those kind of things. Are what are they doing as far as um, let's start with social distancing? Are, are they able to spread the kids out, cut the class sizes, things like that? So in Ontario, we have quite a conservative uh, provincial government, uh, and there was a big labor fight. Uh, earlier in 2020 um, about class size, largely about class size. Uh, and uh, so the provincial government wasn't going to budge on that. So class sizes are nominally the same. Uh, so the kids are only distanced by one, one meter or three feet uh, hmm. in, in most classrooms. Now, having said that, uh, after this provincial government came in, my daughter's classes got quite large. Typical number would be in the low 30s for number of students. This wow. year, her class is much smaller. It's in the low 20s uh, because there's not that many kids uh, uh, or not a full complement of kids coming back uh, into the school. So, uh, but still, they're only keeping a meter distance inside. One meter. Is that enough? You know, the short answer is um, no. Uh, but the longer answer is that even two meters isn't enough. Uh, I was giving an interview a couple of weeks ago, and I said, look, the whole concept of physical distancing inside, it's fiction. Uh, you know, certainly farther away is better. I'd much rather two meters than one meter, and I'd much rather three meters than two meters. Uh, but the reality when it comes down to it, everything we know about particles and aerosol transport in indoor environments you know, there's not enough distance in the world. There's very clear evidence in the literature, as well as just from kind of basic common sense that some of these particles are traveling, you know, distances tens of meters uh, indoors. And so, you know, um, but I have to say, on the other hand of it, my daughter's school, which is, you know, downtown Toronto school, it's not had a single case yet um, mm -hmm. that's been detected and testing is not horrible uh, uh, here. Actually, it's not great, but it's not horrible. Uh, and so, um, so you know, maybe, maybe it's not the issue. Now, we haven't had terribly cold weather yet. So windows in some schools can be open. They're spending a lot more time outside, 100% mask policy, um, you know, other than when they're eating lunch. Uh, and, you know, they're paying a lot of attention to the protocols and so on. So it's unclear whether, you know, physical distancing would be an issue if there wasn't as much attention paid to those other things. I think that's, that's an important point, though, that it's not just one, you know, wearing a mask or physical distancing or ventilation or right. washing uh -huh. your hands. It's the combination of things that, uh, that is going to help lead to decreases. Mm -hmm. um, what about, you, you mentioned they have a um, universal masking what type of masking is required, if any? Do they have guidance on, you know, you have to have two layers, it has to be a certain type of cloth. Um, and what are your right. thoughts on the whole masking issue? Okay, so we've seen a really um, evolving and frankly confusing um, uh, picture on masks in Canada as a whole, but everywhere. So schools, any mask uh, is a cloth mask of any kind and, you know, Let's let's be honest here, you know, getting a bunch of kids, especially young kids to wear a mask. Um, I'm much less worried about the mask than I am uh, about them having one on in the first place. Um, and, you know, I have to admit that, you know, I was wrong on masks in January and February. My opinion on masks is that they were to protect other people uh, from me. And because I didn't realize then that there was so many asymptomatic carriers uh, of the disease, then, you know, I figured, well, I don't have symptoms, so I don't need to wear a mask. If I do have symptoms, I'll wear a mask. That's a, a very kind of rational behavior. I think what we've learned since then are two things that are really different. Number one is that, you know, there are all these asymptomatic carriers. So wearing a mask as a general policy indoors is a good thing. 
And then the other thing I think we've realized is that masks can offer some protection for the wear uh, from others. And so we just had a, some federal guidance uh, suggesting three layer masks uh, are appropriate uh, in, that was at the federal level in Canada. And so um, I think that's the direction we'll move. But, you know, frankly, I wear glasses. Uh, you know, I have yet to find a good mask that I can wear on a cold day uh, that doesn't fog up my glasses when I'm outside. And, you know, even when I'm inside uh, in a lot of environments, especially if I've just come from being outside, my glasses are cold and my glasses fog up like crazy. Uh, in fact, I was just looking at my glasses this morning, realizing that, you know, I wasn't seeing as well. And I was like, oh, I, you know, it's probably because, you know, my eyes have gotten so much worse, which is probably true. But then I realized the the coating on the inside is entirely um, trashed. Uh, and it's entirely from probably me clean, having to clean my mask, you know, every 14 seconds uh, when I'm inside. Uh, so. That's interesting. Cliff, I think you had a follow up. Yeah, I did. You know, you, you said a couple of minutes back, Jeff, that you, you know, were talking about uh, uh, Toronto's uh, coming into winter time now. And, uh, you know, we, we know flu rates go up uh, in, in winter. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hung up on this humidity thing. And, I uh, love can, this question. <laughs> yeah. Can, yeah. Can, you, can yeah. you comment on it? Because I, I'm, I, I'm yeah. kind of a believer in it. And, uh, oh, yeah, no, I am too. Okay. Yeah, I, I've been saying right from the beginning, this is the thing that's keeping me up at night is, you know, as we go into winter here, um, you know, we heat our buildings and, you know, it's dry outside anyway, and it gets really dry inside, like amazingly dry. Like the, I think James Scott has this fantastic quote that there's uh, uh, there is, you know, nowhere on earth that's as dry as the corner of a heated living room. Uh, you know, and it's, 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 uh, yeah, so it's dry inside. And that has two big effects in terms of respiratory disease generally in COVID, you know, specifically. One is that we all become more susceptible, right? And so that's part of the reason why flu rates go up in the, in the winter. But the other thing that happens is these droplets. Remember that, you know, a droplet containing the virus is not a fixed entity, you know, so you breathe it out and it, it shrinks. Uh, or grows, but generally shrinks in dry environments. And that happens fast, like order of magnitude of, uh, you know, a fraction of a second, right? And so that drop has shrunk. And so all of a sudden, you know, these people without kind of knowledge of aerosol science are saying, well, that's a big respiratory droplet. It's going to fall to the ground right away. And it's like, well, no, you're forgetting the fact that it's just shrunk to be, you know, kind of like one to three microns or a number like that, or even smaller. And that's why it's going, part of the reason why it's going tens of meters inside. So like I have this, you know, I think I've, I've gotten much better at trying to say this. It's like increase ventilation as much as you can. But, uh, but you know, if you start hurting humidity or comfort, then you got to find either ways of dealing with that or, you know, dial back on your ventilation and use filtration. Uh, or other measures to reduce the risk. And I mean, I think that's the, that's the kind of the messy answer is that, you know, um, like I, I really, I'm being genuine when I say that's what keeps me up at night is like, you know, an old school with, um, you know, where someone made a decision, let's open up the outdoor air dampers all the way and just bring in a ton of outdoor air and then we'll just heat it like crazy with the radiators or whatever. Um, you know, that's a, fantastic decision if you forget about humidity interesting that's kind of a catch-22 for people um uh, absolutely so how absolutely. do we you know what, what do you recommend do we do we have to add um portable air filtration devices in in classrooms and in office spaces uh, do they help yeah, so absolutely. Um, so I, I say two things. One is if you have the capacity for central filtration, you know, that's the no brainer in this, right? So you increase ventilation as much as you can. So all the guidance says keep RH inside between 40 and 60%. And so if you're going below four, that's the, the optimal place where viruses will uh, survive uh, uh, the least long. So, so if you're going below 40, 
then dial back on your ventilation, assuming you're already meeting ventilation guidelines. If you're not, you've got other problems to solve. But uh, so, so dial back on your ventilation. Portable filtration, great solution. Good, you know, tested portable filtration that actually works, uh, of course, uh, and sized appropriately for the space. And, you know, look, I understand there are procurement issues, there are costs with that. Uh, but all kinds of people are doing cool stuff with, you know, improvised box fan filter combinations, uh, uh, you know, and people are finding ways to get filters and, you know, that's one solution. And then if you can do something in the central system, absolutely do that too. And, you know, you, you made the comment earlier about kind of layers of controls. And this is exactly, we, we have to have some flexibility here. And, you know, the other thing that's kind of worth mentioning in this is, you know, there's a lot of people who give the advice, just open the window. And of course, that's good advice. You know, when adding windows, or opening windows adds ventilation. That's a good thing. Uh, but the, the flip side of it is that, you know, it's a very different thing to open a window and, and, you know, drive down the humidity in the space or to open a window and cause kind of unintentional air flows or to open a window and not get much ventilation at all because there's no driving force. And so, you know, Opening windows should be in the mix, but there's a lot of yeah buts. You know, if you're near a busy highway, I don't want you opening the window to the school, or to the classroom. If, you know, there's going to be so much noise from the construction across the street when you open the window, of course, we want to keep the window closed. But that doesn't mean you can forget about ventilation. So there's all these catch-22s, you know. You know, do I ventilate and kill the humidity? Do I open the window or not? You know, do I use this filter that's noisy? Um, you know, all these things. And yeah, it's our new reality. Uh, and uh, uh, all we can do is kind of, I think it's messy, but kind of do uh, a room by room, space by space assessment and do the best thing for that space. And, you know, if we hadn't systematically under invested in our HVAC systems for the past many decades, we'd be in a lot better place to do more with our HVAC systems. But the reality of it is a school built in the 1960s or the 1920s or the 1980s is going to really be unlikely to be able to be meaningful on the, on the, um, on the, on the ventilation uh, question. So of course, portable filters, why not? Now, we, we talked before the show, and this is, I guess, another catch-22 based on research you have done. You know, we're talking about increasing the filtration, better filtration in buildings, and yet you were telling us before the show research you had done not long ago, I guess in 2019, on filtration in homes um, was not as uh, encouraging as I guess we would like. Uh, can you give listeners a little yeah. idea on what, what I mean by that? Yeah, so just like with ventilation, you have to do it well. Filtration is the same thing. And I think we think we focus so much on the filter efficiency, we forget that that's a small part of how well a filter works. And we found lots of things. This project was ASHRAE RP 1649. There are several papers on it. You can see them on my webpage. Happy to send anyone papers. If you're a member of ASHRAE, you can get the report from the final project for free. But the, the, the bottom line, uh, uh, what we found is that in a lot of cases, even a high performance filter, we tested MERV 14 filters, MERV 11 filters, MERV 8 filters, a couple of different types of MERV 8 filter. And, you know, a MERV 14 filter can perform horribly like a MERV 4 filter in some homes because of bypass, because of face velocity issues. Uh, and, um, so in a lot of cases, you know, the advice I've been giving people about COVID is, you know, all the, the, the recommendations are for something like a MERV 13 filter. And that's great. I mean, if you can get good MERV 13 filters at, and your system can accommodate them, fantastic. But for a lot of people, they'd be better off getting a lower MERV filter and just addressing the fundamental issues, like making sure you've got a good filter slot so that thing seals. I mean, that's like the most basic thing, but, but it seems to be missing. Then another thing we found in the study, and I think we had found this before in other contexts and other people have done stuff on it, so it's not maybe as, as, as unique as that other finding, is that, you know, a lot of homes, especially, and even some, some rooftop units and other types of systems, they don't actually run that much for a lot of the year. 
So um, with uh, Marianne Tushi, who's a colleague, we analyzed data from 7,000 um, American homes that all had smart thermostats. And, you know, typical run times were about 18%, meaning that 82% of the time air isn't going through the system. So it doesn't matter what filter you have in there. And in our study in Toronto, we did most of the field work in 2017. Um, you know, the typical runtime was a pretty mild, both summer and winter that year. Typical run times were like 10% averaged over the year. Wow. So again, you can have the best filter in the world. And if 90% of the time air isn't going through it, of course, it's not going to make a difference. Uh, and then one other thing, uh, uh, obviously, I like to talk a lot. But one other thing that just, you know, struck me so much from that project is we tested filters when they were new, and then we let them go for three months, and then we tested them again. Uh, and a lot of those filters we tested both in the homes as well as in a commercial lab doing a 52-2 test. And those filters declined in performance. First of all, big differences in how much they declined in performance. Uh, so some declined a little bit, some declined a lot. But almost all the filters declined a fair amount in performance uh, over time. So even if you've got a filter that you've got, you know, the bypass dealt with, you've got the air flowing through it, you know, at the end of the filter's life, which we took the manufacturer's recommendations of three months, you know, some of those filters were performing way less well than they were when the filter was new. And that was also seen in the, in the 52-2 test results. So that's not just the kind of installation issue, although that's part of it. Some of it is just the raw efficiency of the filter declines. And so, you know, again, like the, the central message I take from the project is, you know, we've kind of always neglected residential filtration. There's a lot of reasons for that. And I bet a lot of what we found also applies to commercial buildings. But, but we better be paying a lot more attention to the kind of nuts and bolts of, of the filter. You know, having a good filter uh, isn't enough. You have to use it well. And, you know, that's the story of buildings, right? Like, you know, you can take, you know, this beautifully sustainable building and, and, and build it terribly and it won't be sustainable anymore. It's the right. same thing for all the components in the building, including the filters. Well, you, you brought, that, that leads me to a couple of questions and I've got a couple of excellent text questions as well. But let, let me start with this. Prior to the show, we had talked about, okay, yeah, as the filter loads, you get more bypass. All right, let's say we fix that. But you also mentioned just the the filter material um, and, and the electrostatic. A lot of them are based on in part on electrostatic. Can you talk a little more about what happens with that? Yeah, and you know uh, yeah, I can, uh, but I have to admit I don't really know. So basically, what happens is we know the efficiency goes down, and that's been documented in the literature as long as there's been charged media or electric filters. What is happening is I think two effects. Uh, and I think one of them is much stronger than the other one. One of them is that, you know, just things that are charged will discharge over time because of ions in the air and charged particles and, and, and other things. But the other thing that's happening is you've got this charge filter and it gets covered with a layer of stuff. We all know what a dirty filter looks like. It doesn't look like a clean filter because there's a layer of stuff on it. So even if the media itself is charged and even if that charge persists, which it doesn't, um, you know, there's now uh, uh, a bunch of stuff that's, you know, probably negating that charge or at least minimizing the impact of that charge. And here's the thing that I don't really understand. There's all kinds of interesting research on that. Um, uh, you know, relative humidity appears to affect that effect, what the filter is loading with, how much is loading with all effect, how much it declines, although we don't really have a fundamental understanding of that, or at least I don't have a fundamental understanding of that. But the, the, the thing that I think is, is kind of interesting here is that we don't know how fast that happens. So there's one of the early papers. I wish this, it was just an ASHRAE report. I wish it was a paper uh, by Matty Letamaki and his colleagues in Finland. They took a filter in a commercial building in Finland and it was a really good filter, let's say it was 70% or even better at 0.3 microns. And um, they measured its efficiency uh, in a test rig when it was new, 
performed, like I just said, you know, a really decent filter. And then they did it every six weeks or so. They would pull it out and test it again. And this thing is just like a steady march down. And this filter was, it was a thick filter. It was rated for a year. After nine months, when they stopped the, the, the measurements, the filter was performing like, uh, uh, I don't know, at that same, you know, 0.3 microns, it was maybe 15% efficient. Hmm. Right. You know, so there's this huge drop. And so that, that one was a pretty steady drop down, you know, every, every six weeks they measured a, a good size drop, but you know, in some filters, I bet that's happening right away. Other ones, maybe it's happening after much more accumulation. And so, um, all I can tell you is that the decline happens. It happens differently in different, different buildings. Uh, and um, I think it's really important to filter performance. And what about the availability of that filter media? It is, as I understand it, there may be some issues there as well. I mean, you've got competition for filter media these days. Yeah, oh, absolutely. So one of the most like eye-opening conversations I had early in the pandemic uh, was uh, with Jim Rosenthal, uh, a, a friend, and we were talking about, you know, the recommendation around MERV 13. And he was like, I can't get melt blown media anymore. Uh, and, uh, you know, as far as I know, that's persisted throughout the pandemic. And melt blown media is the stuff that's used uh, to make, you know, those MERV 13, 14, 15 filters. Uh, and so there's been a global shortage of it, at least partially because, um, you know, it's also used in things like N95 masks and in other PPE. And so, you know, we face this and we see it in portable filters too. You know, God help you if you've tried to buy a portable filter uh, in the past few months. Uh, but um, especially in Canada, I think it's a little better in the U.S. But, but, but I think that it's, it's this um, fundamental issue that, again, you know, everyone was talking about, at least here, about procurement of PPE and how that was a major issue, and that certainly is. But now we've got a major issue on, on, on buildings. And so, like, I feel kind of bad. I tell people, yeah, use, here, use a good filter, you know, use it well, here's how you do that. And then it's like, they can't buy one anywhere. Um, and, and so I think that, again, you know, again, this is a little bit of a Canadian perspective, but I think it applies globally too. We have to do so much better on some of like this is critical infrastructure, right? Uh, right. Especially during a pandemic, and so we have to address some of the these supply chain issues for sure. And there's all kinds of interesting things happening all over the world with things like nanofiber media and other things that you know we could see you know revolutions in filter media. Um, although I think we're a little ways away from that yet, but. But, you know, this is like one of those great problems that we should, you know, be getting together as a society and solving. IAQ Radio industry sponsors are Particles Plus engineers and manufacturers of feature-rich particle counters and air quality monitoring instrumentation. Learn more at ParticlesPlus.com. Count on us. Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online digital magazine for industry professionals and consumers. Subscriptions available at HealthyIndoors.com. And AEML Laboratories, free FedEx shipping, great pricing, same-day results, and never a rush fee. Learn more at AEMLinc.com. Association sponsors are the Indoor Air Quality Association, a multidisciplinary organization dedicated to promoting the exchange of indoor environmental information through education and research. Learn more at IAQA.org. The American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA. Healthier workplaces, a healthier world. Learn more at AIHA.org. And RIA, the Restoration Industry Association, the granddaddy of the restoration industry. Network with leaders. Learn more at RestorationIndustry.org. Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. See more deeply through science and research. Learn more at SiriScience.org. That's C-I-R-I-Science.org.
ACGIH, advancing the careers of professionals working in the environmental health, industrial hygiene, and safety communities. Interested in defining their science at ACGIH.org. I've got several great questions. I want to start with, what is the difference in filter life if the furnace fan is on continuously versus the 10 to 20 percent runtime found in your research? Okay, so the manufacturers base their three-month lifetimes. This is for one-inch filters. It might be different for, for thicker filters, but for they base that three-month runtime on untold, or the three-month lifetime on a runtime of 20 to 25 percent. So if you're running your filter continuously, you know, divide three months by five, let's say, to get the filter lifetime. And so you're now down, you should be changing that filter every two or three weeks. Now, that's ridiculous on one hand, but I mean, I always go back to, you know, how does your filter look when you change it? And that's not a perfect indication because, you know, you might not have a geriatric super shedding cat like I do, or, you know, <laughs> other things that are nice indicators of, you know, uh, 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 how dirty that filter is getting. But, you know, the filters, we had several filters in the study where people did run their fans a lot. Uh, and we sometimes had to change them after six weeks because they were so plugged. One house, uh, they ran their fan, not continuously, let's say 30, 40% of the time. And after six weeks, we would get a call because their furnace was whistling because the filter was so plugged. And so, you know, the reality is, you know, whatever the manufacturer says, assume that's based on, let's say, a 20% runtime. And so, you know, if the manufacturer says every six months you've got a deeper filter, you know, you should be probably changing that every month and a half or so. Interesting. I've got another similar well, question on the same topic. Um, certainly, they agree that electronic filter becomes less efficient as they load, but wondering about why media filters also get less efficient as they load. Uh, why would they not get more efficient for a while until they get too loaded? Yeah. Okay. So we only had one non-charge media type in the sample, a regular Merv 8 filter. Okay. And that filter didn't change very much in performance, but it did change a little bit. Sometimes it did get better, which is what you'd expect. Uh, and sometimes it didn't. Uh, and what we think is going on is that this whole idea of a mechanical filter and electret filter, like that's kind of made up, right? Like every filter is going to have charged some amount of charge in the media and every filter is going to have some mechanical removal too. And so every filter has got both those things and maybe a very small amount of, of, uh, 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 of electret removal and, and a lot of mechanical removal or the other way around. And so that's why you see some changes, but we did see on average the, um, Merv 8, uh, um, uh, uncharged, or non-electret filters performed on average the same when they were new and old. Now, why didn't they improve in performance? Good question. Um, we did have some filters in the whole sample that did finally start improving in performance. Uh, and I think what's going on is maybe our sample of homes was relatively clean. Uh, and so maybe we just didn't get enough loading to get to the point where you loaded more. The other thing I think that's going on is um, I wonder, you know, how much we're basing things on, okay, there's more stuff there, so it's a better filter as it loads, but forgetting about things like bypass. So if you have enough stuff there that you've got a nice dust layer, you know, it's serving as a better filter. It's also probably got more pressure drop and forcing more air around the bypass gaps uh, of the filter. And so there's this kind of I think that's a negative feedback loop. Maybe it's a positive feedback loop. I get my feedback loops mixed up, but the bottom line is that there are some things pushing it in the other direction too. And then the other thing we find is that a lot of fans are, you know, they're not ECM motors. They're, they're, they've got no speed control on them at all. And so they see a bigger filter, uh, filter pressure drop, maybe because the filter is dirty uh, and they move less air. When you move less air, you're going to get, lower velocities at the filter 
and you're going to get less removal of uh, big particles and maybe more removal of small particles. And so part of what's happening is there are these like a filter is a very dynamic thing. Right. And uh, and so uh, I think that it's changing enough over time that maybe, you know, all these things start being that we don't see the performance changes that maybe we expect from theory. Interesting. Jeff, I had a um, an earlier question about hydroxyls um, and, and the use of, you know, I, I know schools are being, you know, sold on or, or at least people are trying to sell them on these hydroxyl generators and other methods for um, helping to helping with the coronavirus. Any thoughts or comments on that? Yeah. How much do you like hate mail? Um, uh, so, I mean, the bottom line here is that, you know, I always come back to, okay, what's a proven tested technology? And, you know, we come down to, if they're done well, portable filter units, uh, and it's less rarely done well, but if it is UV. And everything else, plasma, ionization, hydroxyl radicals, um, you know, I'm open to the fact that they might work, they just haven't been demonstrated to work in independent good science. And there's always the potential for, for downsides, right? Mm -hmm. And the big thing with hydroxyl radicals is, you know, they're engaging in lots of chemistry. Maybe some of that chemistry helps you, but some of it does definitely not help you. And there's all kinds of byproducts. And I mean, it's just amazing the kind of stuff you see uh, in environments with some types of air cleaners. And so, you know, again, I know that this is, you know, charged and I know that there's a lot of manufacturers who would be unhappy with what I'm saying, but, you know, every time uh, I see data, uh, independent data, I want to be clear, I know there's lots of ways manufacturers can do tests to kind of show the advantage of their products. But every time I see independent data, I see, I've seen nothing that would let me recommend anything other than, you know, media filtration and, um, uh, and you know, well done UV. Um, and, you know, I'm open to, to, to there being, I'm open, I'd love to be proved wrong. Um, I'm, I'm open to there being other technologies. I think like there are some people who are using kind of uh, small ionizers to kind of enhance removal to a, to a filter. And as long as there's not ozone production or byproduct production, I think, you know, that's something that probably has some, some is worth kind of investigating further. But there is, I mean, you know, every day I get, and I can show you the emails I get from people saying, oh, look at this fantastic device. I want to get it for my house. Should I get it? And, you know, I have to have this, this it's almost written by lawyers, uh, you know, response that kind of goes through the evidence on, on all these things. And, uh, you know, sometimes the manufacturer gets involved, I get some hate mail. Uh, and, you know, it's just like, it's the same thing with the sharper image 15 years ago. I mean, you know, we have technologies that work um, and I'm open to there being new technologies, but the first thing you have to do is prove that it actually works. Uh, and there are good standardized ways of doing that. The second thing you have to do is you have to prove that it doesn't cause any harms. Uh, and then the uh, third thing you have to do is uh, you have to show that there aren't better alternatives uh, out there. And I can't tell you a single technology that satisfies those three things. I, I think, Cliff, you want to jump in here? Yeah, just, just for a second. But in, in any event, uh, I, was, I just wanted to run something by Jeff that I happen to have uh, found recently. I was investigating a, a problem motor uh, in a house after a water damage. And uh, the lady initially uh, objected to the use of uh, the antimicrobial that was used in the house. And uh, at some point they installed UVC lights uh, in the HVAC system. And from that point on, uh, the homeowners moved out and so on and so forth. They had all sorts of strange odors. And in doing research online, uh, I found a study uh, was actually done by some engineers in Canada who I think make or work for a company that makes UV, UVC lights. It was presented at ASHRAE. And what was interesting is you were talking about uh, cat dander and so on and so forth in your house. But what they, uh, what they found 
was that UV reacts with something in skin and something in hair to produce very, very unusual odors, uh, mm -hmm. skunky, sulfurous odors, mm -hmm. which are really not hazardous. But mm -hmm. when someone smells them, all of a sudden, uh, they get nervous about it. And this can, you know, this nervousness can really accelerate. So, and I, you know, you commented on well done. And, you know, I think one, and I found some other studies that there were other burning type uh, odors. And again, there were reactions with plastics inside the system. So I agree Absolutely. with you with the well done, but I think these people need to take the proper precautions of not just installing the equipment, but being sure that they isolate plastics and, uh, you know, they consider dust and so on and so forth before they do it. No, absolutely. And I've had two emails yesterday from people who want to use these UV systems that it's like a portable unit. You put it in the room and right. it's got an occupancy sensor when people right. are out of the right. room right. and it comes right. on and blasts everything with UV. And I said, first of all, that's not necessarily a great approach for a whole bunch of different reasons. But I said, second of all, what's in the room? What's UV compatible there? And, you know, the, the hospitals are using UV as a right. method of cl right. room cleaning now. But, you know, every single thing in the room is designed to be compatible with UV light for many right. of the reasons you just mentioned. And, you know, you know, so I've always been, you know, kind of, I don't know, biased isn't the right word, but I've always had issue with UV, not because it doesn't work. I think when it works, That's it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But it's just like, you know, we can't even install a filter, right? And now we're going to install, <laughs> you know, a UV lamp that needs pretty sophisticated electronics. You have to think about the safety issues. You've got to do some pretty good calculations on, you know, making sure you're delivering an appropriate dose to the air if you're trying right. to kill something right. in the right. air. And, you know, we're doing this with components sometimes that come from the low bid, you know, Chinese factory that changes every, every two minutes. And, you know, we're somehow expecting, you know, magical performance. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you know, th there aren't a lot of shortcuts in the world of HVAC. Like I'd much rather, you know, have a technology, like a filter, I understand, you know, I can, I can look, I can measure the bypass, I can see it. Uh, uh, but, you know, so I, I wanna be like really clear, like I'm all for, like UV especially, because it actually does have a bunch of evidence uh, to support it. Uh, uh, but some of these other technologies, I, I'm all for, we should really be doing a good job investigating them. But the other thing I would say is that like, we don't sometimes know problems. Like it's not like there's a magical sensor that can measure pro byproducts. Byproducts are hugely complicated. And I'm always struck by when some of my colleagues do this fantastic indoor air chemistry research. It's like, I look at the things that are produced under kind of very ordinary indoor scenarios. And it's like, huh, I didn't even know what half those things were before I read this paper. You know, there's this amazing paper, I think you've had uh, someone on talking about it before, about this classroom in Berkeley. And one of the main things they found in the air was the siloxane D5. And it comes from personal care products, particularly antiperspirants, I think. Uh, and, you know, that was the most common VOC in this space. And it turns out that's like a very common VOC. If you look back at research from 20, 25 years ago, Jane Davidson at, uh, at Minnesota did stuff about siloxanes depositing on electrostatic precipitators and um, uh, making the corona wires inactive. And so we've known about it there. It turns out in the International Space Station, they're dealing with big problems with uh, siloxanes coming from astronaut personal care products, getting into the air and then into the water system on the space station. And so like there are all these things like, you know, I knew what a silo siloxane was and never paid much attention to it. And then it's like the dominant VOC in this classroom in Berkeley. And there's so many stories like that of, you know, all these, this interesting chemistry that, you know, we, we know nothing about until someone, you know, decides to look at it with the right instrumentation. And then it's like, oh man, what else have we missed? You know, you, know, you, you mentioned earlier that um, you thought that masks were uh, good for source control early on and that that was their 
the primary reason for using them and that you've kind of changed your thoughts on that a little bit and and um, you feel like they may provide a little more protection than we thought for the people wearing them. Uh, what what changed your mind on that, Jeff? Uh, data. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, we got a lot more data. I've always been impressed every time I go to Asia, um, almost anywhere in Asia, when young people have respiratory disease of whatever kind, they have the symptoms, they put on a mask. And I always thought, that's a great policy. Uh, and that's something that I would like to aspire to. And, uh, you know, it's just part of life, right? And then at what we've seen, because the pandemic has taken so much effort, is there's all these great people doing research on mask performance, mask reuse has been a big issue because of PPE shortages, um, all these people testing different materials, trying to adapt different materials, coffee filters, vacuum cleaner bags, HVAC filters to use in masks. And, you know, people are actually testing them and, and, uh, uh, and there's been a, a bunch of data and uh, uh, Brent Stevens, who you've had on before, he has a great blog post from a couple of months ago on, on masks and just kind of goes through all the science of masks and, uh, uh, you know, what we know. And, you know, if you're going to take, if you're going to care about masks, spend the five or 10 or 15 minutes to read that, that, that post. And you came away from it. At least I came away from it, you know, uh, absolutely convinced of the value of masks if they're done well. I mean, there are two issues. There's the mask itself in the thing that we kind of forget a lot about is the fit too. Uh, but if you can have a good mask and have it fit well, um, yeah, you're offering protection for yourself uh, uh, as well as protecting others from you. I'm, I'm curious, what kind of mask do you wear and um, how do you ensure it fits well and then, you know, that, it, that it's working? Yeah, so I unfortunately have a big nose and I've had a lot of trouble finding masks that fit me well. Um, so I wear a three layer cloth mask for kind of ordinary every day. And it's got, you know, the metal piece. So it fits against my nose and it's pretty good. If I fiddle with it for a while, I can stop the glasses fogging up problem if it's not too cold outside. Um, but when I'm doing anything that I would call kind of high risk, so that is, you know, sometimes there's people in my lab, uh, did some, um, uh, um, emergency research for some anesthesiologists early in the pandemic. Um, I just get four layer surgical masks and have everyone wear in a properly fitted uh, uh, surgical mask. I had a bunch of N95s. I gave them away because there was such a shortage here, but I kept one that like, I just kind of rode that thing into the ground, like all the straps <laughs> broke and I would kind of glue them together with Gorilla Glue, glue and um, it's doing various uh, sterilization methods on it from time to time, but that thing just looks like a rag now. Um, I'm still looking for good masks. I mean, one of the, Canada's a great place, but one of the things is that we, um, we, we don't have quite the variety of consumer stuff uh, that the US does. So. Uh, like my friends in the U.S., I would say, hey, what masks are you using? And then I can't find a way to get them here. Uh, so I'm still looking around for the perfect mask, but that's how I handle it right now. And what, what kind of efficiency do you think they have? I mean, is it, is it 50%? I mean, you, you're talking three layers yeah. of cloth with a, a clip to help around the nose? Right. Um, yeah, so uh, if it's so if it's well-fitted, and by the way, for – we could spend a long time talking about this, but I'm most worried about virus transmission in one to three micron particles. And so I'm going to guess that kind of a well-fitted three-layer mask as I'm wearing it is probably kind of 20% to maybe 40% efficient for that size particles, if I'm lucky, maybe a little worse than that. Um, and you might say, well, that's horrible. Like, especially if it's lower than that, let's say it's only 10%. But right. my perspective is everything we've learned about this virus is that, you know, this is, if there's people who know infectious disease listening, they're gonna make fun of me for this, but you know, the kind of the dose makes the poison, right? The more gene copies of the virus you get that, that have the ability to cause infection, the more likely you are to get infected. And I think there's pretty good evidence that the worse you'll get infected too. 
And so my opinion is if you can even cut that down a little bit, you're, ho- you're, you're helping on, the, on the, the dose problem. And again, you know, you talk right at the beginning, it's a layered measure. Um, you know, you're, you're hopefully going into environments that are paying attention to ventilation, filtration. You're hopefully doing all the things like washing your hands, you know, um, and, and paying attention to, to all the things we can do. And then I think masks become part of that as well. You know, you've done a lot of you know, reading on this, not so much research, but you follow the research. What do you think is the main, main mode of transmission? Oh, boy. Um, that's political, too. Uh, and, you know, I have to admit, you know, it's at the this is not this is based on reading, not on on, you know, deep subject matter expertise. But um, I think that everything I've seen says close contact is is important. Uh, and I think that that is a big part of that is simply the dose response piece of it, right? You're more likely to breathe in a bigger dose the closer you get to someone. I think that people have underplayed the long range airborne transport of it. And there's been all kinds of politics and other stuff on that that I won't bore people with. But but, but the comment I want to make about that is, like, I was one of the people who signed the letter to the WHO um, very early on. I completely believe that airborne mode is important, but I don't think it's important necessarily all the time. I think when you get, like, the risk factors are, you know, poorly ventilated, crowded environment where you spend a lot of time. And so I think that a lot of the risk we're seeing around airborne transport is in an environment or in a space that is poorly ventilated. And so, um, you know, part of the reason, like the ASHRAE standard 62.1 and 62.2, they're not designed for infectious disease. In fact, 62.1 has a big, you know, in the main table has a big footnote saying, you know, these are not designed for infectious disease protection. But I do think that they help you get away from the poorly ventilated environment uh, where that airborne transport can be potentially really important. And then, you know, there's actually a lot of debate about the other modes. I've been worrying a lot about bathrooms and I've always had people pay attention to bathrooms because of the, I think both the fecal oral route and because, you know, they're small spaces often not as well ventilated as they should be. Uh, And so there's a risk of transmission there. And, you know, I have to admit that, you know, uh, I'm basing that on kind of incomplete data, especially around infectivity. Uh, There's this whole debate about whether the virus, if it goes through the the gastrointestinal tract, you know, whether it's completely inactivated or not. And so even if we see the RNA, that doesn't mean that it's infectious. And I get all that data, but I'm still worried about bathrooms. So I'm still getting people in, you know, usual conversations, make sure they're paying attention to bathroom ventilation, surface cleaning. So I think that mode, again, it's probably not always important, but it might be important sometimes. And then the last one is the one that you know, I wish I could say uh, uh, I had the answer on, but, you know, the kind of indirect contact. I touch a contaminated surface and then touch my mucous membranes the, through, the, through the fomite route. And, you know, I wish I could tell you, I, I still worry about it. I especially worry about it in the grocery store. I have this great graduate student, Amy Lee, who did this whole analysis of risk of transmission in grocery stores. And we're kind of deciding where to go with it because one of her findings is that like the fomite risk actually can be important. It's not necessarily important, but if you happen to touch an infected item, particularly if it's in a freezer or refrigerated section where the virus might last on surfaces for a long time, um, you know, there might actually be a, a, a pretty big risk there, even though I think that's a little bit out of line with people who know a lot about infectious disease transmission. And, you know, so like we still wash all our, all our stuff from the grocery store, especially if it's, you know, going in right into the fridge or the freezer, uh, or it's something that we're going to eat raw and not cook. Um, but, um, but the jury's still kind of out on whether that's an important route or not. And, you know, I really don't have the expertise to say, but so if I had to rank them, I would say close contact, airborne, um, and then kind of both at the same level, uh, um, you know, the fecal oral and the foma transmission. Let's, let's, um, 
John, can you play the roundup music real quick? It only take a second. We're going to go to the roundup here. Listen, I, I, what I'd like to do, give Cliff an option on his first uh, final question. Do you have any final questions or thoughts, Cliff? No, no, I'm good. I, uh, I really uh, appreciate the interview and, uh, you know, I, I think he had uh, some really good thoughts and suggestions for uh, our people. So, I mean, well. I've got two quick ones. I think they'll be somewhat quick. One's a question. One's kind of a tease on what I hope will be a future show, Jeff. But uh, the first one is what research is not being done that you would like to see being done with respect to the coronavirus? Okay, so you had Carrie Kinney on last week, and she talked a little bit about filter forensics. I think we've got this wonderful opportunity now to, you know, take filters, use filters, and, you know, get the RNA for this virus off of them, and to look at the spread of the virus, just like people are doing with sewage. And there's all kinds of challenges with doing this. Carrie has done it. Um, uh, lots of people have done it. And, and so it's possible. And I think we have this great surveillance um, uh, opportunity here to actually look at, you know, imagine taking a filter from a bus uh, or from a grocery store and just looking and seeing how many gene copies there are of the RNA on the filter. That tells us a lot about spread in the community. And, you know, um, you know, it's got a lot of uncertainties and challenges, but that's one chunk of research I'd like to do. The other thing that's even more general than that, as I've been talking a lot these days with epidemiologists who are like fantastic people, but it's like pulling teeth to get them to acknowledge like the building. Let's do some basic building characterization in our epidemiology in both outbreak investigation, but also just more generally. So we can start saying like, you know, oh, we see an outbreak at this gym, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, what was the ventilation rate? I don't know. You know, did they have filters? I don't know. You know, and so just like the very basic stuff where the windows open or closed, you know, that type of data on buildings uh, would add so much. So those are, I think, my two big answers on what research I'd like to see done. Interesting. And what I want, like I said, I want to tease what I hope will be a future show. We talked a little bit about cognitive function and indoor exposures um, called exposing the brain. And you talked a little bit about that earlier, but I wondered if you could add a little bit on what you're looking at sure. or what people are looking at and why you think that's important. Yeah. Okay. So this is like, I know you want a short answer and I'll keep it as short as I am, but okay. So I think fundamentally people like me have been doing something wrong uh, for as long as I've been doing indoor air quality. What I've been doing wrong is talking about all these serious chronic health effects and that doesn't work for whatever reason, indoor environments aren't getting better in a lot of places in the world. In fact, in some places they're getting worse. And, you know, even though I can, make you think that you're going to die because of your indoor air quality or not die, but have a bigger risk because of your indoor air quality. It doesn't change people's behavior or interest. I mean, that's why we don't have, you know, such a poor investment. So this got me thinking about, well, what could we get people do to care about indoor air? And there's been a bunch of research by a whole lot of people on cognitive function. And so what we've been doing, this is with Mike Mack, who's a colleague in psychology, is we've been looking at exposing people to different indoor sources and seeing what impacts it has on their cognitive function. And it's been really fun uh, and really interesting. Where we were right before the pandemic is we were about to go into the MRI and image people's brains as we expose them to things, to different sources. Because Mike's idea, and I think it's a great idea, is that we can make a neurocognitive model of the brain. So we can uh, look at how the brain uh, is specifically impacted by different exposures. And the whole idea here is maybe there's a whole different model of indoor air. Maybe a model of indoor air we should be talking about is let's improve cognitive function. Lots of environments, schools, office buildings, a lot of industries, people will pay for cognitive function improvement. It's an acute effect that happens very, very fast. And so we can improve the indoor air pay for that by this cognitive function improvement. Uh, and then we don't even have to talk about these health effects, which for whatever reason, aren't very compelling to people a lot of the time. 
And this is like a model that, you know, essentially um, I stole from people who used to do energy conservation research in, in the 90s. A lot of people realized that energy conservation wasn't selling that well, at least in some, some, some markets. And so instead they said, well, let's just make a better building. We won't tell people it's energy efficient. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the better building had fewer contractor callbacks. It was more comfortable and it saved a ton of energy too. Uh, but with the energy saving wasn't a selling feature. And I think we might get to that with indoor air. And I think there's all kinds of interesting issues here. Like for instance, you know, the whole model of indoor air has been, let's remove things from indoor air. What happens if adding things has a cognitive function improvement? And I'm not willing to say that that is the case, but what happens if that's the case? Mm -hmm. Now, all of a sudden, like that turns everything on its head. And so there's uh, not saying this is simple. The brain is enormously complex. I mean, I look at the output of an MRI and I'm like, yeah, you see something there, but, but I don't see anything. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, you know, not saying this is easy or short term or anything, but that's, 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 I think a, an interesting place to go. And I'll just mention on that. If we have a lot of research results, we can talk about some, which are slowly being published, but we did publish a, a review paper in indoor air that just came out this month on, uh, carbon dioxide and the impact of carbon dioxide on cognitive function. And if I were to summarize that paper in a sentence, it's, there's a lot of research that shows that cognitive function might be impacted by higher CO2 concentrations, but at least some of the research we think shows something different. And that is that uh, reducing ventilation hurts cognitive function. It also raises CO2, but CO2 might not be the causative uh, mm -hmm. a reason behind that. It might be something else in indoor air, which is increasing in concentration. And so um, uh, I encourage people to look at that paper. I mean, it's a scientific review paper. It's not everyone's cup of tea. But the, the important thing there is that, you know, this is a whole new world. There's all kinds of interesting things we can explore there. And uh, I, I really think there's enormous opportunity to, to do what's frankly being done in a lot of environments already. People are shaping indoor air already people are adding sense in stores and all kinds of other things and i think there's a potential to you know use cognitive function and indoor air exposures for good you know we'll, we'll have to get you back to talk more about that and and in less than five years jeff <laughs> yeah sounds good absolutely thank you so much uh, i want to thank this week's guest dr jeff siegel great show uh, my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. John, you got to have faith at the controls. Next week, we've got uh, Dr. Marilyn Singleton coming on. She's an MD, and uh, she's got a juris doctorate in jurisprudence as well. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about the coronavirus and uh, get different perspectives. So looking forward to that. And uh, most importantly, want to thank our sponsors and our loyal listeners. Please come back next Friday at noon for the next episode of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening.